Hello, everybody, and welcome to Genealogy Garage. I am Julie Huffman, the Genealogy Librarian here at the Los Angeles Public Library. And Genealogy Garage is our online series of programs uh, related to the world of genealogy and beyond. Um, we're also co-sponsored by our friends at the Southern California Genealogical Society and the Genealogical Society of Hispanic America, the Southern California chapter. Hello, friends, and thank you. Um, if there is anything you have been wanting to hear about, feel free to send me an email to let me know. Um, you can see my email here on the lower left side of the screen. Just shoot me an email anytime you'd like. In April and May, we're going to be having genealogy garages on Chinese genealogy research. So if you know friends or you yourself have interest in that, tune in. Um, and we also cover all kinds of different topics, but I'm always interested to hear what you'd like to, to learn about. So um, today our pre presenter is running a little late. Uh, he's going to be here around 1130. So if you need to leave and come back, that's absolutely fine. But I do have some um, items of interest to talk about. Uh, and uh, this program is going to be recorded, so you can watch it later if you'd like, if live is not convenient. Um, if you would like to ask questions of our presenter or of me, just sign in to a YouTube account. You have to have your own YouTube account and sign in, and then you can post questions in the comments box, and we'll get to them. And when Chris, our presenter, is talking, I'll probably ask those of him at the end, but as you think of them, just send them in the box and then we'll have them all ready to go. Okay, so there were a couple things I wanted to just tell you about while, while we're waiting for Chris, and I'm going to bring up um, a little thingy here. Let's see. Okay, so this is today. We're talking about California reparations, and Chris, he's you're going to find out such a dynamic speaker. He's so great and positive and forceful. I just really like to hear him speak. Um, he also, he did a uh, talk on this at our last June Jubilee last year, and uh, it was a really great event. But basically, he's going to kind of be covering what does reparations mean? What is the current status of reparations in our forward-thinking state of California? And what do you ha what would you have to do to qualify? Um, so this is Chris right here, and he's the lead organizer for the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California and the American Redress Coalition of California. Both are reparations advocacy groups. So as I said, he's going to join us around 1130. He sent me a couple um, flyers to, to let you to tell you about, and I'll probably bring these up at the end of the session as well. But um, there is a... Uh, a, um, a new state agency that's been proposed that would talk about, that would help us figure out how to deal with reparations, how to qualify for them, that sort of thing. And so if you want to take action, find out more information, here is the code you can scan. I'm just going to leave it here for a second. But as I mentioned, this is, session is going to be recorded. So you can come back and get this later if you'd like. The second flyer Chris gave me was this one, which is kind of a reparations action group. Um, and this is the code you can scan to find out more information about that. And then also I found this, which is the reparations report online, a governmental document. And if you wanted to read the real details about it, you could go to this URL and uh, read up. Now I'm going to talk about a couple things that are happening around us that you could uh, dial into if you're interested. The Los Angeles Public Library is celebrating African American History Month, and we have several events going on. To find out what we have, you would just click on this events link, which will then bring up this page. And then on the left, you can see celebrations. That is what you would click on, which will bring up this page. And the first one is the African American History Month link. Once you click on that, 
you can see all of the different events we at Central Library and our branches are putting on this month. Um, so play around in that. They're all free. You can find something near you. And uh, it's a there are several. It's a big celebration here. Another Heritage Month um, that we're celebrating is, well, it's not a month, but June Jubilee. We did that last year. It's an all-day affair here at downtown Central Library. And uh, last year was a roaring success. Great feeling of community and joy, and we have all kinds of stuff. And this year, the theme is going to be art uh, in the African-American community. And we just got the date set up. It's going to be Saturday, June 8th, 2024. It's going to be all day long. And uh, it's a great time. I hope you can come down. It's all in person. Um, and it's just a fabulous, joyous time. We don't have a breakdown of what events we're going to have yet. So just keep tuned into our website. And then this is something I was just alerted to earlier in the week by our friend Lynette Allen. Um, it's the 18th Annual Family History Seminar, uh, the African American Genealogy Seminar. And it's it takes place in Sacramento, but this time it's virtual. It's going to be online via Zoom. So you can respond to them and get a Zoom link and sit in on it. And they have a lot of really great uh, presenters this year. So there's no need to go up to Sacramento. You can watch it from home. Registration is only $12. And it, like I said, is a great, fantastic lineup. One of our local friends groups um, is it's the California African American Genealogical Society, or CAGS. They, they operate out of the west side of Los Angeles great group of people. They've done pre presentations for us. We've done presentations for them. Uh, they helped us out with Jubilee in a big way last year, and they're a really great group of people. Well, they always have things going on, and they meet at the Los Angeles Family History Center uh, on, library on the west side. And uh, if you want to talk with other people about what they're doing to discover their African-American heritage, um, it's a really good communal effect. And also, they have a special collection they've put together of funeral programs, which is really neat. And uh, it's collaborative. If you have funeral programs you'd like to donate to them, they would uh, put it in their group thing. And then you can see who else has funeral programs loaded. And that's a, a really neat local way to research your ancestry. Another one of our local friends is the Southern California Genealogical Society, and they have ethnic research groups and an African-American interest group led by Charlotte Bocage, my friend and fellow presenter. And they are located in Burbank and very great. They have their own library, online and in-person uh, presentations, but check them out as well. And this is something I stumbled on the other day, onto the other day, because I'm sort of addicted to MSNBC. Um, but I saw that there's a new podcast that uh, Tremaine Lee is hosting um, about the history of reparations called Uncounted Millions. And I haven't yet gotten to listen to this. There's a part one, so I assume there'll be more, it's a series. But um, it sounded really interesting. The description of it describes that this is not a new idea. Uh, reparations have been talked about since the Civil War, believe it or not. So if you have a moment, if you're into podcasts, you might want to check in on this one. And like I said before, this is going to be recorded. So don't worry about scribbling down this URL. You can come back and uh, pause it and get it slowly. Now, all these genealogy garages, which we started during the COVID year, um, most of them have been saved and recorded, and you can view them after the fact, which is great for me because I have experts come in who talk about each specific 
aspect of genealogy and uh, it supplements what I know, which is not as much as they know. So you can always go and watch one of these recordings later. And so I'm going to show you how you would get to our YouTube channel. This is our um, YouTube page. And if you scroll down, you'll see playlists. I'm going to click on playlists. And we have all kinds of videos that we've recorded in the past. Here's one re related to June Jubilee, by the way, which we just talked about. But if I scroll down here, I see Genealogy Garage, and you want to click on View Full Playlist. And this brings up all the Genealogy Garages um, we have been uh, approved to keep on our website. Lots of really great items of interest here. One that might be of interest to you is one I did ages ago, Genealogy Garage, Finding American Slave Ancestors. Now, if reparations ever goes through, you're going to want to have, you're going to need to prove your descendancy from an enslaved person. This might give you some beginning tips on how to do that. Let me see what it looks like when I click on this. Most people make one terrible mistake when investing. They never see there. <laughs> If all you ever do Just is trust buy me. It, uh, this will eventually bring up an hour long uh, how to find your ancestors. Another thing I want to point out is the Los Angeles Public Library has many uh, databases, ways that you can't to help you research your ancestry. So to do that, you're going to want to go to this page on our website and click that history, ge geography, and genealogy box, and then click find it. And it's going to bring up a whole list of databases that you might be interested in as, as far as researching your ancestry or background. Um, you can access many of these from home if you have one of our library cards. So make sure and go to your local branch or central library to get one. You just have to be a California resident. They're free and you have to just, but you have to apply for them in person. So you have to go in there, show your ID and proof of your current California address. But once you have that, you have many databases available to access from home. And you can also access a lot of our e media material. We've got a lot of audiobooks, which I'm addicted to. We have ebooks, all sorts of things you can get from home. But some of them you don't even need a library card for to access. So this is how you would get to all of our databases. So we are just going to wait until 1130, which is in about 15 minutes for Chris to arrive. So go get a cup of coffee and then just come back to this very same uh, YouTube page.
Hi, everybody. We are back. And um, Chris has joined us. One moment. Let me bring him up. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are so fortunate to have Chris Lodgson with us. He's a lead organizer with the Reparations Advocacy Groups. Let me bring up a banner, promote this a little. <laughs> Coalition for a Just and Equitable California and the American Redress Coalition of California. And why reparations are such a hot topic in the genealogy community, among other communities, is that because you will have to use genealogy to prove that you descend from enslaved ancestors if you want to take advantage of any sorts of reparations our government might agree to. So if you were looking for any good reasons to start your family history research, do it now. Here it is. Okay, I am going to turn it over to you, Chris. Very nice to see you. Oh my goodness! Thank you so much. I, I am I am so happy to be here, uh, and I want to uh, just give my uh, my apologies to start uh, for you know for joining later than I expected to. One thing that is very important about this movement for reparations, this 21st century movement for reparations, or what we call the new reparations movement, the new reparations generation, if you will, is that a lot of us are, as we call ourselves, everyday regular black folks and other folks too who are, I think all of us really volunteers. And so as volunteers, you know, we have uh, day jobs and night jobs and kids and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, apologies again for joining later than I expected uh, because, um, you know, we're, you know, we're all volunteers here. So we're, you know, doing work and all that stuff like you are too, but you've taken your time out to be here today. And I am so happy to be here with you. And as uh, my, my good friend, Julie said here to start, um, this is, you know, something that people are talking about here in the state of California, and that is reparations and, of course, genealogy. So what I'm going to do today is just give you sort of an overview quickly about sort of, you know, uh, sort of California Reparations 101. I want to talk about a little, bit, a little bit about where we are now and why that matters to genealogy. And then I want to ask any questions you, you have. And then I want to leave you with um, some calls to action. Uh, so let's get into how we got to where we are. California Reparations 101 in 2019 and 2020, a bunch of us, as we call ourselves regular black folks, you know, started to think more and talk more among each other, offline and online about reparations and about why we never receive reparations as black Americans who descend from persons who were emancipated um, uh, you know, from uh, U.S. chattel slavery, and I, and you're you're gonna hear me use those words a lot. Black Americans who were who are descendants of those who were emancipated, or Black Americans who are descendants of those who were enslaved. It's a very important new way of talking about who we are as a people, as a specific and unique group of people, not just defined by the color of our skin, the beautiful, rich color of our skin and not just defined by our beautiful, rich culture, but about who we are and what we've contributed to this country and about who we come from. So 2019, 2020, we started talking more and thinking more about reparations and we got the attention of some of our state legislators, specifically uh, in 2020 or 2019 rather, uh, then, a state, then state assembly member, Dr. Shirley Weber, now of course, California's first black, I think, Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, uh, who was interested in working on reparations, resolutions and bills in 2019 and then in 2020, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, Dr. Weber, Sec Secretary Weber, was very clear to us in the beginning, clear with us in the beginning that this effort that she was interested in was specifically about a particular lineage, a particular lineage, a particular lineage of black folks specifically those who are descendants of those who were emancipated from American chattel slavery and those who are California residents also. And so she and her, her team you know, made us aware that there would be actual reparations bills coming to create a task force to study and develop reparations proposals for African Americans and African Americans. And as it says in the bill, uh, with a special consideration for African Americans who are descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States. And so in 2020, uh, this bill to create a state reparations task force, the first of its kind 
something that California had never done, something that the country had never done. This bill was introduced in 2020. This bill was called AB 3121, if you're interested, Assembly Bill 3121. And this bill created a task force to study and develop reparations proposals for African-Americans who are, who are descendants of persons who are enslaved in the United States with, with special consideration for African-Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. And so that bill went through the process as most bills do. The governor signed it once it got out of the state Senate and state assembly. Our team, of course, helped write the final version of the bill. We helped advocate for the bill. We went to all the committee hearings and met with legislators and gave public comment and did rallies and support and did all kinds of online work. And the bill was passed and the governor signed it in 2020. And that created a nine member team of people whose job it was to do three things. First, study reparations with a particular focus on California's history. California was not a free state. So it turns out, so we've learned. We've been taught that California was a free state. And by free state, we usually mean a state where there was no slavery. But we've learned that that is not true. In fact, there were over a thousand, close to 2000 African-Americans who are enslaved here, right here in the state of California. Some right where I'm sitting right now in Sacramento and some where you're sitting right now in Los Angeles. In fact, I think the city of Los Angeles can trace its roots and its origin back to uh, one of our enslaved ancestors named Biddy Mason, who herself was formerly enslaved and who I think migrated to the LA area from the San Bernardino area, if I'm not mistaken. So California has a history of slavery. So part one or job number one of this task force, study California's history, lift up California's complicity and responsibility for slavery in the state. Second, educate the public. As we say, bring knowledge to the people about what it learns. And then thirdly and finally, and this is actually where we're at now, or a little bit, little bit well, we're a little bit past this part now, but uh, thirdly, develop reparations, plans, and remedies. And so the task force worked for two years, starting in January of 2021, and then finishing their work in last summer, January, uh, uh, sorry, June of 2023. So starting June of 2021, rather, and finishing in June of 2023 uh, to do those three things. And they produced at the end of that two years, a almost 1150 page, 1200 page report, one, documenting all it's learned, two, proposing ways to educate the public, and then three, proposing reparations remedies. And one of those remedies was that the state of California should directly compensate descendants of persons who were emancipated from chattel slavery in the U.S. and who are also California residents. And one of the other remedies was that the state should find a way and create a way to help residents who are potentially eligible to trace their ancestry. So if I asked you right now, those who are watching, how do you know if you are a descendant of someone who was enslaved or emancipated from US chattel slavery? Now, I was taught that and told that by members of my family, my grandmother, my mother, other members of my family, aunts and uncles, regularly talked about who we came from and where we came from out of the South, out of Georgia, out of Alabama, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing that I've heard from and 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 you know have have been told by genealogists, and I think it was mentioned when we started that a lot of times we start our genealogy history and search with our family, asking questions of, to our family members. Where do we come from? How did we get here? What's my grandmother's full name? What's my great-grandmother and great-grandfather's full name? Who are we related to? What cities and counties and towns did we come from and when and why? We start with our own family history, of, of course. And so one of the things that the state of California Reparations Task Force also recommended is that the state help us find out whether or not we are descendants of persons who were enslaved and emancipated and potentially eligible for reparations by the state creating something called the California American Freedmen Affairs Agency, which is something which you can think of as a reparations agency. An agency to one, help residents show that they're eligible and 
then apply for reparations, but specifically on showing that you're eligible inside of this agency, the state is recommending that the that there be created a genealogy office or something called the Office of Genealogy. And that Office of Genealogy would be required to work with local genealogy associations, professional and certified genealogists, subject matter experts to help individuals trace their ancestry back to enslavement and emancipation in the United States. Now, I thought it was gonna be hard for me to figure out with documentation whether or not I was a descendant of persons enslaved in the United States, but the state task force actually, when it was doing its hearings over those two years, asked certified and professional genealogists and subject matter experts to come to the task force and to, to answer the question of how do people determine and show that they are descendants of US chattel slavery. And although the genealogist said, yes, for some folks, it's going to be harder than others, generally because of our new technology, because of the fact that we've made great advances in record keeping and documentation and digitization of records and research. And because we've learned more over the generations about how to do this, for most folks, it's not going to be as difficult as you think. And for me, that was the case. Uh, I was, you know, told by my mother maybe one name from somebody in our, our family. And with that one name, I was able to use some free, easily available uh, online resources, specifically through the U.S. Census and then through FamilySearch.org, which the U.S. Census works with, to trace my ancestry and my family relatives back to the period of enslavement in this country, back to the 1860 census. One of the things, and I, I want to I want to talk more about the genealogy office, but I want to lift up something that we've also learned through this process of trying to figure out and talking to genealogists about how we find out if we're descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. One thing I want to flag for us is that through this process and, and through the process of doing that, what started to happen is that we started to repair parts of our family history that either we knew was broken or that we didn't know was broken. I wanna give you an example personally. So I'm, I've am i told this you know publicly before, I didn't grow up with my father. I met my father maybe once or twice in my life, mostly when I was young, four years old, and I think I'm seven years old, but I don't really remember it. And so, but I never asked my mother about my father, never asked her, never, never asked her. Uh, but, <coughs> excuse me, because we've been talking about reparations recently, <laughs> I've been more curious about where I come from because I want to be sure that I'm eligible for reparations, okay? Because <laughs> uh, don't we need it, right? So I started to ask my mom more questions about who my father was very recently over the past year, year and a, year and a half. And I could tell at first there was some, some unresolved energy you know that that sort of needed to be, or 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 you know you know you know there was room for for some for some healing, uh, and so you know over 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 time after a while that healing started to happen, and my mother started to open up more about my father, and then at a certain point the floodgates opened. She started tell, telling me about all kinds of other people in my family that I've never heard about be before, her uncles and their great uncles, and what what happened back in Georgia, and and what started to happen is that we started to heal mother to son uh, and grow closer mother to son. And, and I want to flag this for us because this is also a big part of the genealogy journey that we've been on as a people here in California, those of us who are descendants, uh, and as a country, really, to really fix something and repair something that was broken long, long ago. And that if we hadn't fixed or don't fix, we'll only get worse. And so I wanted to flag this for us too. And I want to come back to that at a certain point also. But back to the state task force and this office of genealogy. So the state task force is recommending this office of genealogy be created. And in September of 2023, so late last year, state Senator Stephen Bradford, who represents parts of the LA area, I'm not sure if he represents the place where uh, or the you know the specific neighborhood where the LA uh, Public Library is, uh, but uh, State Senator Stephen Bradford, who represents the LA area, 
then introduced a bill to create a California American Freedmen Affairs Agency. The bill is called Senate Bill 490 or SB 490. And right now that bill is making its way through the state legislature uh, in California. And we have been very big supporters of this bill, Senate Bill 490, specifically because it creates a reparations agency uh, and because it will create this office of genealogy, the office where folks will go to show that they're eligible for reparations and to 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 apply for reparations to get their claims processed, their their payments processed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a particularly a, a very important piece of the reparations journey and the genealogy journey. So I want to talk a, a little bit more about where we are now and where we're going next, but I want to say more, if I can, about the power and the 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 necessity of genealogy right now and genealogists and sub subject matter experts right now on this particular topic of genealogy. So in November of last year, our organization, the Coalition for Just and Equitable California, which as mentioned is California's first only and leading statewide volunteer led, descendant led grassroots organization born just for reparations. One thing we've started doing over the past uh, several months, specifically though, starting in November of last year, um, was and is to hold genealogy and reparations workshops. And we were we were very blessed and honored and fortunate to work with for the November event that we did, the California Black Women's Health Project, which is based out of Los Angeles, also, uh, and the uh, uh, the Soul of Beehive, or which some of you may be from, familiar with, is a great you know workspace, a, a beautiful, beautiful space. In, I think it's in East LA, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, but somewhere in um, uh, the LA area. I'm going to get it wrong because I'm up in Sacramento, so for, forgive me. Uh, but uh, we work with uh, the California Black Women's Health Project, which, by the way, is um, our fiscal sponsor, just for transparency. The California Black Women's Health Project is our fiscal sponsor at CJEC. Uh, and then we, we work with them and also uh, the, the Solar Beehive to host a genealogy workshop along with one of our coalition partners, which is based out of the Inland Empire area, um, a group called the California Black Lineage Society, and a great organization who I know many of you know, Ancestry or Ancestry.com, um, to host a genealogy and reparations workshop. And what we did was bring as many community members as possible, <coughs> excuse me, to the Solar Beehive campus to learn more about reparations learn more about genealogy, and then actually actively work and trace your ancestry back to American chattel slavery and emancipation live right there at the event. And I can't tell you how powerful this event was. Let me give an example about how powerful it, it was. So there were a mother and daughter who came to the event to learn more about their, their history. At the same time, there was uh, another woman who, who came to the uh, event to learn more about her history. In the process of us, you know, meeting and greeting and eating and, and you know, uh, you know, uh, our people are so awesome. It's like whenever we get around each other, we don't have to know each other like personally, but it's like a family reunion. <coughs> I say this sometimes too, when I'm walking around you know, and I'll, I'll see another black person. I'll just do do like that. Uh, I've said like this to, to myself too. All black folks, you know, are family in some way, uh, but especially us descendants of persons who were enslaved in the in the United States, we are really kin and we are really family. Uh, and so, at this event, uh, the mother and daughter, and the woman, the other woman who 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 came to the event also, found out that they're actually related. That they are actually related. So think about this. These are people who, you know, you know, didn't know each other be before this event, came from different walks of life and different communities here in the in in and around the LA area or there and around the LA area. And at this event, uh, at this family re reunion, uh, found out that they're actually related. And this is part of how important and powerful the work of genealogy is, and how important and powerful the work 
of reparations is. And so this is something that we've started to do more of these types of events where we're connecting very directly the genealogy work and the reparations work specifically for Black Americans who are descendants of those who were emancipated um, and, 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 and those who were um, you know, enslaved in the United States and those who are California residents. <coughs> so uh, I wanna give, give you a sense now of where we're going next, but there's one other thing I wanna do first. So I've been talking about our group as a specific group of people, and I want to make a couple of points on this because there's more that you need to know. So first, the state task force, the state of California reparations task force, uh, when it was doing its work over those two years that I mentioned, part of the other thing that it was asked to do, specifically in the part where it was asked to make reparations recommendations and remedies or, or you know, proposals for remedies, one of the other things inside of there was that the task force was asked to decide who would be eligible for reparations which Californians would be eligible for reparations. And yes, as I mentioned, the bill that created the California Reparations Task Force did say that this is a task force to study and develop reparations proposals for African-Americans with special consideration for African-Americans who are descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States. But the bill also says that the task force is required to determine who should be eligible itself. And so, one question that we were getting around when the bill itself was was being advanced and through the task force's term and time was it says special consideration for African Americans who are descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States. That implies that there may be other considerations. And so the and so who, if any, are the other considerations for reparations in California? And so we asked the author of the bill. Uh, Assembly Member Dr. Shirley Weber, Secretary of State Dr. Shirley Weber, who, if any, are the other considerations? And she said there are no other considerations except for one. And that other consideration are the descendants of the free Blacks who were living in California. You can think of these as our ancestors who may have uh, emancipated themselves before the official emancipation in, 18, in the 1860s, let's say. So the descendants of the free Blacks who may have emancipated themselves in one way or another and migrated somehow to California at some, at some point to become California residents. <laughs> and so the task force, again, as it was asked to decide and figure out who should be eligible for reparations, made a decision in March of 2022, uh, after several months of public and sometimes very contentious, very important, very um, impassioned um, discussion among community members and among task force members, the task force voted that what the bill to create the task force says should be who's eligible for reparations, specifically those who are, dis are Black Americans or, or African Americans who are descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States or the descendants of free Blacks who were living in the United States and in the task force's words, um, uh, be, before the year 1900. And the, the year 1900 is important uh, because uh, from what the genealogists told the task force, 99.999% uh, of any Black American, African American in the United States before that time is a descendant of someone who was enslaved in the United States, States and be, because um, of the, 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 the fact that we actually have stronger records uh, you know, for for documenting your your dis, de, descendancy through and to that point, so, so that was a good point to 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 use according to and under under the recommendations of the genealogist. So to be eligible for reparation in California, you'll need to satisfy uh, the following things. First, you, you you need to be a descendant of uh, an African-American who was enslaved and emancipated um, from U.S. chattel slavery in this country, or the descendant of a free Black person who was living in the United States before the year 1900. And, and this is important, the state task force added this part. This was not in the bill but uh, to, to create the task force, but the state task force added this part. And you need to be a California resident of at least six months at any time between the years of 1850 and 2020. <coughs> Excuse me. So the question that you need to ask yourself to, to understand whether or not you are a, someone who's eligible 
for reparations in California or would be eligible for reparations in California is, am I a descendant of someone who was enslaved and emancipated from American chattel slavery uh, um, or the descendant of a free black person living in the United States before the year 1900? Am I someone who is a descendant of one of those people? And have I been a California resident for at least six months at any time between the years of 1850 and 2020? Why 2020? Because that is the year that the, the governor signed the bill to create the state reparations task force. Excuse me. And then to help folks, as I mentioned, understand and figure out whether or not they fit that criteria, that they satisfy those recommendations, uh, is to create the uh, reparations agency, the California American Freedom and Affairs Agency, is specifically the Office of Genealogy. So the task force makes this decision about who should be eligible and then recommends a way for folks to find out whether or not they're eligible. I wanna say one more thing though <laughs> about uh, uh, this particular part uh, be before we move on to where we are going next. So, you know, we've been re re referring to ourselves as a specific and unique group of people. And this I think is very, important for black folks to think more about and understand more about, but also um, non-black folks too. So we, the descendants in this case, are a specific group of people. In many ways, we are uniquely American. We are people whose ancestors were involved in, in fighting for this country in every single war. We are people who have been in this country and you know, many of us before there was the United States of America. Um, we are a people who has contributed um, greatly to the development of this country. We are our own specific people. We are our own specific people. <laughs> we are our own specific people. And this is important to understand. Some of the other work that we've been doing here in California as a part of the reparations work is to help our state and our cities and our counties and of course our people understand that we are a specific group of people and to start to count us as individuals and specific group and, and a specific group of people. And so how we've been doing that is We've been working to require our state government first, and then now our state, our, our cities and counties to start to collect data on us as a specific group of people. You will be maybe surprised to know that before a few weeks ago, California, any state office you walked into, in California, any city office you walked into in California, any county office you walked to, into in California and asked the question, can you tell me how many people here are descendants of US chattel slavery? There will be no answer because our state, our counties and our cities did not collect data on us as a specific group of people at all for 400 years. Has not collected any data on us as a specific group of people. Does not or did not even have a, have a category of data collection for us. So you know how you fill out census forms or, or you fill out your employment forms for state jobs, or you or maybe you get hired for a state job or a city job or a county job, and they ask you on the on the on the form, tell us about your demographic inf information. You know, uh, you know, you know, are you, you know, what's your age range? You know, you know, what, you know, what 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 gender may you identify with? You know, and and hey, can you share some race and, and ethnicity inf information for us? Generally, up until now. We've been under this big, broad thing called Black slash African American. Black slash African American. Right now, the or it's changing now, but up until very recently, the definition of Black or African American at the state level and, of course, at the federal level too, is this. And this is the definition that our state gov our state governments were using, our cities, our counties were, were using, our federal government is using. Our Census Bureau is using the, the definition of Black or African American is, quote, anybody with origins in the Black racial groups of Africa, period. Anybody with origins 
in the black racial groups of Africa. That could be me, maybe. It could be somebody who may look like me, but may be, um, you know, maybe immigrated to the United States from one of our, you know, African countries, right? Nigeria, South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. It could be one of our brothers and sisters who immigrated from one of our Caribbean um, um, countries, Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, et cetera, et, et cetera. It could be one of our brothers and sisters who immigrated from one of our South American countries. Also, this is a big, broad category. There are multiple groups inside of this big and broad category. But what we realized very soon and very um, you know, quickly is that we, as a specific group of people, Black Americans, this, this descendants of those who were emancipated from American chattel slavery, were invisible. <clears throat> we were invisible to our state, to our country, to our counties and to our city. And as we've been saying, uh, uh, you can't serve a community if you don't see a community. Um, this is not uncommon for groups to think about themselves as this way, uh, in this way. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Here in California in, you know, in, in the 2010s, I believe, maybe a little bit be 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 before, <clears throat> but here in California, our AAPI brothers and sisters our AAPI brothers and sisters recognize that the big broad category called AAPI, um, Asian American and Pacific Islander, probably has, <clears throat> I think like 65, 75 different national origins inside of it. You could be talking about our Hmong brothers and sisters. You could be talking about our Cambodian brothers and sisters. You could be talking about our Korean brothers and sisters. You can be talking about our Chinese brothers and, si brothers and sisters, our Japanese brothers and sisters, uh, you know, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And so what our AAPI brothers and sisters did is they went to the state government of California and said, we need you to disaggregate and delineate this big, broad AAPI category and specifically identify the specific and unique groups inside of this big, broad category. Why? So you can first see these groups as specific groups, which they deserve to be seen. Secondly. We think that when you see the group specifically and individually, you'll notice differences in the material needs and material conditions in each and among each group. And they made the same case that we've made that if you don't see a community, you, you can't see a community. I think one of the one of the one of the quotes from the advocates uh, for the, for this work was um, that better data um, uh, means better policy. So the better you can see the problems and the or the better you can see the problems and the challenges and the needs and the conditions, uh, the more able you are to devise and create good, accurate solutions to those challenges, problems, needs, and conditions that are tailor made for that specific group. That are tailor made for that specific group, and once they're tailor made, they have a better chance of actually working. And we've seen this with the AAPI community. Uh, and so what we did here in California starting in 2021 is we started to go to our state government and our governor and our state, uh, state, state senator and state assemb assembly members and say, hey, we are a specific group of people also. We are a particular lineage. We have a particular genealogy. We have a particular history in this country. And we need you, state government of California, cities and counties, to disaggregate and delineate and recognize our uniqueness and then design and devise and create policy solutions specific to our particular needs. Uh, it wasn't only us though. Uh, go back a little bit further. In the late 2000s and early 2010s, our brothers and sisters from the Caribbean islands actually started to work on the same thing for themselves, specifically, um, though at the national level and on the U.S. Census, and so in twenty in the late two thousands and, and early 20, 2010s, there was a movement uh, created called the Carib ID movement. The Carib ID movement, <coughs> excuse me, and the Carib ID movement um, were, was a movement to uh, urge and motivate the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, which 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 you know is which 
puts out our U.S. Census forms every 10 years and in bet between those years also. Two, allow our Caribbean brothers and sisters themselves to identify their unique country and na nation of origin on the U.S. Census because they recognize also that this big, broad African-American and Black category made them invisible too. <clears throat> and one of the quotes, I'm going to paraphrase the, the quote by one of the activists back in the late 2000s and 2010s, um, says some, something to the effect of, under this big, broad Black or African-American category, you, you can't tell if you're talking about someone like me, and this was the case of the activist, who you know, was born in Jamaica and, my, and immigrated to the United States, or if I'm a descendant of someone whose ancestors you know, sur 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 survived American chattel, chattel slavery and, plant and plantations in the United States. And they were absolutely right. And, and so what they did was advocate and urge the U.S. Census to create ways for them to identify themselves on the, on the U.S. Census. And after many, many years of advocacy, they were successful. And that's why on the last census, the 2020 census, <coughs> excuse me, there were specific categories of data for those who are Caribbean, um, uh, of um, Caribbean ancestry. Uh, and so our Caribbean brothers and sisters have the opportunity to write in, I am you know, of Jamaican origin, I am of Bayesian origin, I am of Nigerian origin, I am of Ghanaian origin. Uh, and so that was something that we thought or that 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 we saw happening. And and the question for us was, well, where's ours? Where's our category? Where's our specific category of data collection? And so well what we started working on was this effort to do the same thing. And we start here in California and in 2021, uh, we wrote legislation uh, and language that would require all California state agencies to start um, to collect data um, that has a category specifically for descendants of persons in the United States, first of its kind. Never happened before. Think about this. We've been here 400 years. Think about what we've done for this country. Our state and our country still didn't even see us as a specific group of people, didn't even count us as a specific group of people until we started the work here in 2020 uh, with the work of and the support of assembly member Chris Holden, who I believe is also a assembly member who represents parts of the LA area, who I think is running for um, another position uh, locally in LA, I believe soon too, uh, after his term ends in the state assembly. Uh, and so um, member Holden um, uh, uh, listened to us, um, thought what, what, what we were saying made a lot of sense and then worked with us on language to introduce uh, in another bill that, that he had, um, he, he, he just sort of added our language to it. Uh, it was Assembly Bill 105. <laughs> well, uh, that bill got all the way through the state assembly, all the way through the state senate, got to the, got to the governor's desk and then the governor vetoed it. <sighs> the governor vetoed our bill in 2021. Uh, that would have created this category of data collection for us. And the, and the governor's reasoning was, um, even though the, 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 the bill had other other things in it too, so there were, there were some other reasons also that weren't re related to our, our language. But part of what the governor's ra rationale was that because this, <coughs> excuse me, this language to create a category of data collection across all state agencies for, de for descendants um, would involve state agencies and would involve a financial cost, he would have rather that be done in the state budget bills as opposed to a standalone bill called AB 105. And so we said, OK, uh, we see you, governor, and we're going to raise you one. And so we, we came back in 2022 with another 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 bill, uh, same language, same member, member Chris Holden, uh, AB 1604 um, that had the same language in it. And later that year in 2022, the governor requested that that language from AB 1604 be taken out of that that bill and transferred into the state budget bills that year. And in 2022, the governor signed uh, Senate Bill 189, specifically Section 14, that is our language to, to require all California state agencies to collect data for descendants of U.S. chattel slavery, this specific and particular lineage, this specific and particular genealogy, this specific and particular group of people. Excuse me. And so uh, in 2024, a few weeks ago, all California state agencies. Oh, do I have a 
a picture of it right now. I, don't, I almost I usually have a prop where I have like the form actually with 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 me that I show you. I don't have it with me right now. Um, I, I was going to show you the actual form with the category of data collection on it. I think I do. I'm going to grab it right now. Thank you. And voila. Hopefully you can probably can't see this <laughs> very well. <laughs> this is a Cal HR hiring form. This is a form that, okay, so I'll just sort of describe it because I'm, I'm not sure if you can see it specifically. So this is a Cal HR hiring form. This is what you get after you get hired for any state job, right? So California has two and a half million state employees. <coughs> All state employees, after they get hired, have to fill this form out that asks for demographic information for a number of reasons. There's a red highlight here. This red highlight is the Black or African American category. And it says Black or African American at the top here in the bold black. And then underneath, there are some subcategories you can pick. And I'm just going to read to you what it says. So Black or African American at the top in bold. And then it says, uh, check this box, basically, if you are a descendant of a person or persons who were enslaved in the United States. Check this box if you are not a descendant of a person or persons who were enslaved in the United States. Um, including but not limited to uh, African Black, Caribbean Black, or other. Uh, and then three, uh, check this box if your descendant status is unknown or you choose not to answer. What you're looking at right now is history. You're looking at history. Never before have we been counted as a specific group of people. Now we are. Never before has our lineage, has our history, has our genealogy been recognized by our state. Uh, now. It is. This form went live three weeks ago. For sorry, uh, three to five weeks ago. Uh, and not only this form is starting to collect this data at the at the state level, but now also the application forms that you use to apply on the front end uh, for any state jobs are also asking this genealogy or this descendancy or this um, lineage uh, info information. But we're not done yet. So. Uh, we went back to member holding uh, late last year and said, you know, this is this is great. Uh, we're happy that, that, this, that this that this is happening at the state level, that this genealogy, this history, this lineage is 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 being recognized and start starting to finally be counted. But that's the state level. What about California's 482 plus cities? What about our 58 plus counties? Shouldn't we be also collecting this data and counting our 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 community members uh, at the local levels too? And member Holden agreed. And uh, two and a half weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago or, or so, um, a member Holden introduced on our be behalf Assembly Bill 2089. Assembly Bill 2089, the, the 2024 version. Assembly Bill 2089. And this bill would require all California counties, 58 plus counties, 58 counties, and all of our 482 plus cities and the entities that are both city and counties too. We have some counties, cities and counties, we have some entities that are both cities and counties too here in California. Uh, all of them um, would be re required to, to, to create a category, category of data collection specifically for descendants like this. Okay, and I know you can't see it because of the background, but trust me, I'm telling the, the truth. <laughs> so, so, um, I'm saying this to say, not only is this related to, of course, the reparations work, because this is the community that, that, that would be eligible for reparations in California, but because this is important for us as a people, period. We are a specific and particular lineage and group of people. We are a specific and particular lineage um, uh, of, of Americans. We are proud of this. We are proud of our people. We are proud of what we've come come through. We are proud of what we've overcome. We are proud of what we of what we've accomplished, and we are proud uh, uh, you know, of who who we are. And our future is bright. Our future is amazing, and we're we're looking forward to creating that future, one that recognizes our unique and honors our unique lineage and history, while building a future that is all that we wanted to to. To be through um, and 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 with reparations. So, if I could stop right there, <laughs> uh, I, 
don't think I've talked for 45 minutes in a while. <laughs> well, have a, a get so a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a couple questions, Chris, and I, I have some too, but let's start with C. Bocage. Um, she's wondering, what about my passing for white cousins? I'm assuming that means do you need to present as black to take advantage of reparations, even if you descend from enslaved people? So the answer to that question is to be determined. Um, uh, and let me give you the exact uh, uh, eligibility criteria. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, that will probably help answer the question. So uh, the, the state task force decided that um, in order to be eligible for, for reparations, you would need to be um, an, an African-American descendant of a chattel enslaved person or the descendant of a free black person living in the United States prior to the year 1900. Now, uh, there are, and we understand that there are people currently today who either don't identify themselves as <laughs> black folks or Af African-Americans, you know, whether or not they may or may not be descendants of persons who were enslaved in this country. We recognize that because of our un unique history, because of what occurred over generations on the plantations, um, that many of us, most of us, have some um, parts of us that are, you know, um, that that include um, European an ancestry also, as a as a, in addition to a number of other or in in, in a number of African country origins also, and a bunch of native, you know, um, or or origins also too, right? That's just, just sort of how a lot of us are are sort of, you know you know, mixed, mixed up, right? Um, and mixed, mixed up in not necessarily a bad way either. Um, but this is, this is part of who, who, who we are. So we, so we do recognize that, that there are folks, you know, put, potentially like your, your uh, white passing cousins. Um, and I have some, some folks in my family and, and you know, who pass also. Um, uh, those folks um, may or may not be eligible for, for reparations. Um, the answer is to be determined. And this is something, this is something that the, that the, that the genealogists um, who work for the agency, the Office of Genealogy, will help us understand. One thing that we do have to be very mindful of is that our constitution in California disallows any discrimination based on race. And so what will likely happen is that um, folks who are descendants, regardless of how they um, identify themselves, would be eligible. So that may include your white passing cousin. And this is again to be de determined. You know, uh, here in in Cal California and what genealogists have told us is that, you know, the number of folks who, who, who sort of may fit in this white passing cousin box and some sort of, you know, you know, group are relatively small here in California, but we, you know, I've met folks who either, you know, don't identify or pass as a, as a, as a certain other, you know, group or you know are mixed race also right and who, who who don't identify with either one individually either race individually so again the short answer is to be determined um, but it is it is possible that uh um, where we land is that uh, anybody who is a descendant of someone who was emancipated from american chattel slavery is eligible and that could potentially include um uh, your and my white passing cousins um, and we have kind of a, a question I had clarified from E. Rich. The first part was, what if you are a resident in 2022 and are still an eligible applicant? And I asked uh, if if they met that they, they were in California for at least six months, but have since left the state. That could be a question. But all but then a follow up was no. If you became a legal resident for over six months in 2022. Does it affect your eligibility if you have become a resident after 2020? Okay, so let me take those one by one. I'm, I'm gonna connect those. I'm gonna start with yours, Julie. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's the right place to start. So the task force itself recommended that you would be eligible if you met the descendancy piece and were a California resident for at any time uh, between the years of 1850 and 2020 for at least six months. So from what the task force recommended, that could include, excuse me, individuals who left California for some reason, but at some point were California residents and who are also de 
the, the descendants. So according to what the task force recommended, that could include individuals who are descendants, but who left California after six months of residency for some reason. And we have very, you know, because of our history, you know, here in not just California, but across the country, <coughs> excuse me, you know, y'all know, you know, black folks, y'all know, you know, you know, a lot of our lives are moving from place to place for a number of, of reasons. So um, according to the task force, you could be eligible uh, if you had left Cal California. Um, if you could, Julie, put up um, E. Rich's first question again, because I want to get, get to it um, spe spe specifically. So what if you are a resident in 2022? Are you still an eligible applicant? So according to what the task force recommended, you would not be eligible if you became a resident after 2020 um, and you are a, dis, a descendant too. You would, you would, you would not be eligible um, uh, if you became a resident after 2020. That's what, what that's according to what the task force recommended. Um, but uh, I think what folks are thinking about now, uh, specifically, you know, the advocates and other, other folks too, uh, are ways to, <coughs> excuse me, extend the benefits um, to folks who may have potentially come to California afterwards, uh, but there are some there are some things that we need to think about and, and think through very, um, I think clearly first, right? Or along along the way first. So, you know, part of what we're we're working on is making is trying to figure out potentially how much this would cost the state of California to to do this, and so it's easier to put a cost on this if you put a cap on you know when people were eligible um so it's easier for, for me to figure out how much this could cost the state of california and then work on getting that cost paid if we you know put a put a cap on when you know after which people would no longer be eligible so that's one thing that, that people are i'm thinking about but on the other part people are thinking about well you know California is still continuing some of these harms. And so, you know, maybe descendants who come after California should also be eligible. Or maybe there are things that folks who came after 2020 who are also descendants could be eligible for, um, but not other, other things too. So let me give you an example. Maybe uh, E. Rich, you and your children are eligible for the free tuition that California could offer, um, you, know, you know, descendants at, you know, at all UC schools and systems. Or in the in, in the UC system, um, but maybe you you know, potentially may not be eligible for another uh, another part of the reparations package. So folks are thinking about all of these things uh, at the same time. Um, but uh, uh, right now, uh, 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 potentially um, those who came after 2020 would not be eligible because the cutoff is 2020. Um, you you just met, and this is me. This is me asking. Yeah, no so you. <laughs> You just mentioned free tuition. Um, what are some of the other reparations that your group is seeking to yeah, provide people? You. Yeah, so we're we have um, two main priorities <laughs> right right now. The first is the, cr the creation of the reparations agency because we think it is the infrastructure or the foundation for all of the other things that come next, and obviously. You know, you're going to need a place to go to apply for reparations. You're going to need a place to go to help you show that you're eligible. You're going to need a place to go to get your claims and payments processed. That makes just sense. Every other reparations case that we've studied has something like that. Our Japanese American brothers and sisters had something I think called the Office of Redress and Administration that was set up, uh, or something like like that, that was set up to help administer. Uh, you know, their rep reparations claims in the 1980s. So that was a place that they went to apply, et cetera, et cetera. Our Jewish, uh, Jewish brothers and sisters um, had, I think, multiple agencies, I think four or five agencies set up to, you know, you know, I think op operating, um, you know, in the Middle East to, to you know, to, to help, you know, uh, uh, folks show that they were eligible for, for rep reparations. Um, so, 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 so there's always some kind of infrastructure set, set up. So, that's our first priority. And, and then our second priority is direct monetary payments. <laughs> we believe that the best way for California to do reparations is to put money back directly into the hands of the people who it was taken from and their descendants in the first place. Uh, this is important for us for a number of reasons. I can't get into them all here. Um, but one, um, we think 
that nothing else is going to work without that. Um, we can do all of the education. We can do all of the, um, uh, you know, the the other other things um, that we're told to to do, which are really good things to do. But our position is that um, if we don't return the wealth directly back into the hands of the people who are owed it, um, all those other things are not going to work. And so uh, our our second and and I, I don't want to say second because it's actually you know. So I'll say you know, 1A and 1, 1, 1, 1B, um, but that is our um, priority right, right now. Um, it is uh, direct monetary payments directly to descendants and the, the agency is a key piece of, of how we actually do, do that. The task force made uh, over a hundred recommendations in their final report. Uh, uh, some, uh, some of those rep re recommendations are actual reparations recommendations. Um, and some are just good public policy, uh, you know, you know, you know, um, also, but, um, uh, for, for us, the, the, the big core recommendations are the, uh, the Freeman Affairs Agency, the Reparations Agency, and the direct monetary payments. How are you doing on time, Chris? Do you have another, uh, meeting? Yeah. Yes, are yes. you okay? Cause, yes. um, I have one, one more question. <laughs> um, so I just, for clarification, if your ancestors were enslaved in Mississippi and in Mississippi only, but you're a California resident and you qualify for everything else, would you qualify to get paid by California reparations? The answer is yes. And let me explain a little bit about, about why. So then this, this was a very important <laughs> debate and discussion that the task force had because the task force had to think through and make a rational case for why California is responsible for compensating the descendants of persons who may have been enslaved, enslaved in uh, Mississippi or like my family in Georgia or in places other than California, although we know there was slavery in California too. And so the task force decided that, yes, California would be responsible for compensating descendants who may have been enslaved in another state because the argument is, and we think this is a very powerful, um, long overdue argument to, to be making, uh, that enslavement is the beginning of the harm and then the legacy of slavery that starts wherever your ancestors were enslaved and that follows you and actually lives inside of you all the way to and through and, and here in California today is what the state is responsible for. So California is, is working on and considering reparations for enslavement and all of the things that came after enslavement and the impact of those things on descendants of those who were enslaved uh, uh, in the United States. And what California is being asked to compensate for um, uh, and and repair um, is enslavement and the legacy of enslavement. And California was complicit in not just enslavement here in the state of, of California, but Jim Crow and what is going on now, too. So, yes, my ancestors were enslaved in Georgia. I have folks whose ancestors were enslaved in Mississippi. There are folks who were, whose ancestors were enslaved here in, Cali in California. Uh, all of us would be eligible for reparations in California. And part of what California is also doing here is making a way, making a case for other states to do reparations also and for the national government to do reparations. This is very important. Ultimately, we believe, and the state task force says in its final report, that ultimately the responsibility of a full reparations program is the job of the federal national government. And so part of what this effort is about is creating, a, creating an example of how this can be done, how this should be done, and then uh, motivating and urging folks uh, in other states and other states themselves, and then of course the national government to do the same. Great answer. I've been, I've been asked this by friends and I'm like, well, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask the. Yes, <laughs> it's it's an important question, and I've and it's a reasonable question to ask. And there were some very powerful discussions and debates among, specifically and particularly, 
Uh, I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but we in, in a, a, a library, so we have that right. So the, the task force hired a team of economists to figure out how much would this cost the state of California. And what the team of economists asked the task force to tell it so that it could answer that question was, <clears throat> who are you talking about first? And importantly, and this is to the, to the question, what are we talking about? What is California being asked to be responsible for? <clears throat> Excuse me. And the, the economists themselves decided or re re recommended rather, and, the, and the, the task force agreed that the best approach to one, being able to put a cost on, you know, how much this would, would cost the, the state of California, but also the best way to also allow us to make a rational case for why California should do anything at all is to ask California to be responsible for the things that California was specifically responsible for. And so that includes enslavement, but it also includes uh, property takings via eminent domain. It also includes other harms in housing and real estate. It, uh, it includes uh, things like uh, harms in edu education, uh, uh, harms and you know to our families, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the task force lays this out in detail through its final report. And so the economists have actually been putting costs specifically on each of those harms and then adding it all up to come up with a total cost. It's a very, very Im important question. Well, and I know this is an aside, we've got another question, but that California insurance companies uh, insured slave owners during that time. So they were making money off of that foul Absolutely. practice. Absolutely. Um, e. Rich has a great one here. Is the establishment of the California reparations being challenged strongly to not be successfully used and created for our residents? Are you getting, I'm interpreting this as like, are you getting blowback from people? Ah, I love that question. Thank you, E. Rich. E. Rich has some really good, 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 good questions. So, short answer is yes. And the short answer, and, and let me add to that short answer to make it longer. Um, we expected nothing less. Okay. As a matter of fact, we expect more. Okay. Uh, you know, I I anticipate or I I I expect and I, I've known and learned that there was strong pushback. Um, against the movement to free people in my family uh, back in the 1800s uh, and before then too. Uh, we know there was strong pushback uh, to open up civil rights for our people, more civil rights for our people in the 1940s, you know, 50s and, and 60s. Excuse me. Uh, there is always going to be pushback and opposition when you're doing something, especially when you're doing something right. Um, and so the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, and it's coming not just from what, what you might think of as the typical um, people who, who, you, who you might think of that would normally be opposed to something like this, but let's keep it real. <clears throat> can, we, can we talk plainly as a people here, black and non-black? Non let's just talk plainly as people, as regular people. Sometimes, and we've and we've seen this here in this in in the case of rep reparations, uh, sp specifically, that um, people who we thought would be on our side are actually either um, not as on our side as we thought, or not on our side at all. Uh, and this has become um, we we think very you know eye opening for us, um, but also has given us the motivation and the the confirmation that we're doing the right thing. Uh, and so I'm gonna just say this plainly, you know, you, you would normally anticipate that the anti-reparations movement or the anti-strong reparations movement, shall we say, also um, would be coming from folks who may be more, you think conservative, right? You know, um, right? But the opposition to reparations is bipartisan, um, ideologically bipartisan, uh, and you know, politically bipartisan, and that tells us that we're in good company, okay? uh, because the opposition to um, uh, the end of enslavement and and the opposition to abolition, quiet as kept, was bipartisan. 
the opposition to the end of uh, the, the opposition to uh, civil rights was bipartisan. Let's just keep it real. Let's talk real. Uh, let's do real history. Uh, and so what this means to us is that we are in good company. Oh, you are muted, uh, Julie. Sorry, rookie mistake. Um, I personally have noticed that our California legislators on either side of the aisle, even the Democrats, especially Democrats, are hesitant to say yes or no. Like they're just kind of dancing around to see how popular this issue is and they're not committing, which I find irritating. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Lee Rich has one more here. Let's see here. It's regarding some of the logistics. Oh, I think you cut out again. You're on, on mute, but I, I can read the question. So it's I temporarily lived in 2016. Uh, I believe in California, re 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 receiving mail at a mailing address of a family member for some months. Could that be sufficient enough? So um, potentially, potentially, and this is partly why the Office of Genealogy is going to be so important because they're going to be helping to write the rules along with genealogy or organizations and associations and subject matter experts. They're going to be helping to write the rules for what types of documentation is good or not good or how we can get more documentation. Um, and, 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 and so that might be enough. Uh, and, keep, and keep in mind too, E. Rich, that uh, there may be things that you would be eligible for um, be, uh, no, no, no matter what your residency, but then there may be things that you're not eligible for be, because of your residency too. So that's still possible also. So I would, you know, you know, I would, you know, I would keep that in mind also, but, but the answer is to your question, it's very possible that that could be something that is, um, you know, one of, of the records that would be um, enough, but that will depend on the work that the genealogy office does alongside the genealogy associations, subject matter experts, and also people like you. Part of what is important about this work right now is that we are early enough in the process that we can help design what the actual rules and recommendations are. And so, Erich, if I were you, I would be one advocating for and supporting Senate Bill 490 for sure um, to, to, to create this agency, to create this Office of Genealogy also. And then two, I would be writing the office. I will be showing, going up to the office. I will be you know, going to genealogy associations and saying, hey, I think we should have a way for folks who are you know, residents after to show that, that you know, after the 2020 cutoff point that they, you know, you know, either were residents um, or, hey, I, I, I think you should use this documentation, you know, you know, et cetera, et, et cetera. So right now we're early enough in the work that we can help design what ultimately we get. Yep, you're muted again. <laughs> no worries, no worries. <laughs> um, I did show people earlier in the presentation those two flyers that you emailed me. And so yes, I thought I could maybe bring those up right now. Yes, just to thank you. Remind them. Yes, yeah. So first, so this is so right now we're encouraging folks to, and I I, I wanna, you know, I want to respect the LA County uh, LA, LA Public Library's um you know uh uh status. So I want to say first, this is coming from our organization. Uh, the views and thoughts expressed right now are not the those of the LA County Public Library, and that shall, shall not be interpreted as such for here, for and ever and after. Amen. Okay. So <laughs> um, I don't want to get you in any political trouble here, but uh, we are advocating for um, uh, this uh, this reparations agency right now. So we're asking folks to um, email their state senator um, to. Uh, to, to tell them that you support Senate Bill 490, that you support the creation of this reparations agency with this genealogy office, that you want them to support it when the time comes, when it comes up for a vote this year, and that you will be using whether or not they do that um, as a part of whether or not you decide to vote for them in this 2024 election year. And so you can scan that QR code um, uh, to, to, to go to a site that has a script already written um, all you do is put in your inf information. It may ask for your address, but you don't have to put in your full address, just your street address, because it's going to use that to locate your state senator for you. So it's click the link or scan the code. And within three or two clicks, you will have sent um, automatically an uh, email to your state senator. And, and we're asking folks to do that um, today, 
right now and then do it every day, every single day, because um, Senate Bill 490 will be coming up for a vote soon um, and, and hearing soon. And then this is uh, a call to action that we, that we have out right now. So in the last week or two, the California Legislative Black Caucus has uh, picked up the work of the State Reparations Task Force and has introduced uh, reparations um, bills and a, rep a reparations bill package. But we've said and you know, to the caucus and to the public that this package is not strong enough. And so what we're doing right now is urging folks in the public to reach out to the California Legislative Black Caucus through that QR code right there. Um, uh, and of course, you can find all this on our social medias too, at CJEC official um, and email the caucus and tell them that you want strong, bold reparations bills, specifically and particularly that include direct monetary payments. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, um, listen, I I feel like I could talk about this for another hour, but um, <laughs> reserve your voice. <laughs> I think we'll wrap it up, but I just want to say that we've gotten a lot of positive comments. You're absolutely triggering our brain uh, to think about things, and that is so important. Thank um, you. But, but thanks so much for spending your time with us, Chris, and maybe we'll ask you back a year or so. You can tell us if there's any new developments. Please do, and I would say Sooner than a year would, would be great because we're going to have a bunch of new developments in the next several weeks and months. So I would love to come back sooner rather than later. Fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you so much and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Everybody else watching, thanks for tuning in and you have wonderful weekends as well. Bye everybody. Sorry, gang. My mouse is uh, <laughs> frozen. All right, there we go. See you later.